Oh, that's very nice. Um, OK, really uh, depressing topic, but hopefully we can make it not so depressing, because I think there's a really good message behind this uh, moving forward. So what I uh, want to see, sorry, I'm just trying to make this thing work. Yeah, there we go. Is that working? Yeah, awesome. Now it'll probably go too far. This is really the boring bit. Just to establish who I am and why I've got any authority to talk on this topic at all. I've only been in esports for four years, but prior to that, for about 15 years, I was in traditional sport, primarily cricket, but also other sports, where I developed an unfortunate uh, reluctant knowledge in issues around betting corruption, because for those of you who have any interest in cricket will know that we've had our fair share of problems in that sport historically. And it was a very, very steep learning curve. Going back to 99, 2000 with the South African captain, Hansi Cronier, who was caught uh, match fixing in India, all the way through to the Lord's Test match in 2010 when the Pakistan team were uh, caught very publicly by the news of the world trying to fix outcomes in that match. And then a range of other things that I've had to deal with over the years. So long story short, I'm a lawyer who got caught up in a bunch of stuff I didn't want to get involved in, but now I happen to know a lot about um, on the integrity front. And I was commissioned to look into the integrity threats in eSport back in 2015 when MTG uh, acquired ESL and then subsequently DreamHack. And we're starting to look at what were the integrity issues around um, eSports, particularly in the absence of a governing body. And this is a topic we'll, we'll return to, is I'm sure most of you have heard that esports described as the Wild West. I think that that's somewhat unfair. It was probably fair in 2014-15. It's an improving mild West uh, to steal Banksy's uh, moniker. So let's, um, let's just drive straight in because what I was looking at in 2015, and this is available on our website as it was published uh, in the autumn of 2015, Obviously, things have changed since then, but the fundamentals remain the same. And what I found uh, in looking at an industry that I honestly knew very little about, um, I knew about the integrity side, but I really didn't know much about esports. So I had this deep dive, kind of two-month uh, dive into the, into the industry. So you know, when you read the report, bear in mind that I really didn't know a lot about the industry at the time, but I've reread the report subsequently, and I'm pretty happy that its fundamentals are the same. And those are that whilst there are you know, a series of pretty normal integrity threats to the industry, there are four that stand out. Now, three of those are obviously um, variations on cheating to win. The principal one being, for anybody in the games industry you'll be very familiar with, which is just cheating. Bots, software, uh, Aimbots, wallbots, you know, all, all the stuff you see in gaming every day. Um, sometimes extremely crude, sometimes extremely sophisticated. And I'll deal a little bit more with the sophisticated end uh, in a minute or so. But the other two that are cheating to win was your typical online attacks, DDoS primarily. Slowing your opponent down is still an attempt to win. And doping is a subset of that. It's another way of trying to gain an, an unfair advantage. Putting doping to one side, what I found was that the industry as a whole dealt with cheating to win uh, harshly and reasonably well. Primarily, I think, because cheating to win is an existential threat to the game. The distinction I want to make there for, is that there's gaming and there's esports. Gaming is a massive industry involving thousands of games and hundreds of millions of people. Esports is the cherry on top of that that distinguishes probably about 15 or 20 games from the thousands of games and creates a competitive scene that crucially has an audience that people want to watch and a professionalization grows out of that and the pinnacle of that, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, are the big games, Counter-Strike Global Offensive, League of Legends, Dota 2, Overwatch, sort of, um, and, and a couple of others. So that, that's what we're dealing with, is esports rather than gaming. But because cheating is a threat to the game, simply because when people get cheated against, 
you tend to migrate away from that game, particularly if you lose a lot. You know, anybody who's had all their loot stolen by some hacker, uh, as I have, um, immediately you just think, I'm not going through another year of building this stuff up. I'm just going to find another game. So publishers take that very seriously because they don't want to lose their players. So there's anti-cheat running. There's a constant, uh, a constant arms race between the cheats and the anti-cheats. And as soon as you're caught, and those of you familiar with the VAC ban system that Valve operates, you're out. You're banned. There's no appeal. There's no nothing. You're just out. Now, if you're a casual gamer and nobody knows who you are and your gaming name is ButtNugget123, you'll be back on in 20 minutes. But if you're a famous player, you're out, right? That, 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 that is a career-ending thing, which is why we don't see that much cheating higher up the ladder in professional games. But as I say, relatively well dealt with, which brings me on to the fourth category, which was third in importance, which was match fixing. And this is betting fraud. It's cheating to lose. And what I found was this was very poorly understood within the, within the esports industry, within the games industry generally. Uh, the response to it was entirely haphazard. I mean, there were very few cases. You had some high profile cases in StarCraft in Korea involving you know, very high level players. The equivalent of, you know, Steven Gerrard being caught fixing football. It, they, these were big guys that had a massive impact. On the other side of the globe here in, you know, in the Western world, we had I Buy Power and Epsilon. These were Mickey Mouse fixes for a few hundred dollars that had an impact within their little communities, but really not beyond that. And the publisher response in those cases was simply to ban the guys. There was no due process. There was no particular investigation, except by the journalist who exposed it in the first place. And that understanding of match fixing and the relationship between betting on esports and esports really concerned me, because there was clearly an abyss of understanding between those two concepts. And betting on esports has a significant impact on esports. Uh, both good and uh, sometimes bad. And there, there was a big problem with that, which um, we then went on to address. So what I, what I wanted to do was update on various issues. Now, in respect of cheating, this, was a, this is a rare case. You know, those of you who were familiar with it, we received reports, um, some of which came through pub, uh, social media at the time, that... Um, uh, Nikhil Komawat had been caught literally red-handed in the middle of a tournament cheating uh, with software that, that he had loaded through his uh, SSD card. Now, I had had previous dealings with Mr. Komawat uh, through um, account selling and stuff. So I had initially banned him for separate offenses, which he then provided evidence that on a technical basis I in effect, was forced, but not, not, not reluctantly, because he did provide good evidence that he wasn't responsible for cheating that had occurred on an account that he had previously owned. So I unbanned him. Uh, and then literally months later, the little bastard cheated in the middle of a tournament. So uh, as I say, I mean, from an evidence point of view, this was really, really simple. We were lucky that he had played in an ESL competition over which uh, the uh, ESIC has jurisdiction some uh, just before the tournament in which he was caught cheating. So I ha we still had the SSD cards unerased from that tournament, which was extremely lucky, found the cheat, which then enabled me to ban him. Uh, and I'll explain why that's significant as we run through. What I, the point I wanted to make here is that while we're taking action on this front, it's extremely rare at esports level, at professional esports level, for guys to attempt cheating, particularly at a, at a LAN event. You know, online, you might expect it in the lower levels, qualifiers, guys to try and get away with it if they think they've got a good, undetectable piece of software. The thing is, that's very hard to do at a LAN event, to smuggle your, your software into the event. But actually, more importantly, from my point of view, your opponents tend to be good enough to spot a cheat. They know when they're being cheated against. So most of our complaints where we have uh, court guys have not been because we've detected the software, but because the, the opponents have complained and inquiries have then been driven by that because they are that good that they know when somebody is too good. Um, so as I say, this, this is 
part of the integrity piece. Um, and so is this, anti-doping. And I wanted to, to create some uh, foundation level knowledge here before we run into match fixing. Because this is really important. In, in 2015, there was a lot of concern around doping because in the middle of an ESL event, uh, a, a member, a current player in the Cloud9 roster had come out on social media in an interview basically saying we're all on Adderall, right? It was a big kind of shock. It, was, it may or may not have been true. I can't comment on that. Um, but ESL reacted by instituting a, an anti-doping program. To be fair, given that it was created by their communications director, they actually did a pretty good job, but it was a little bit messy. So when we formed ESIC, we took over responsibility for anti-doping at ESL events and then subsequently for all of our members. Uh, and I, I will explain membership in a second. I'm really setting the context for cheating is once we started doing that under an organized system, we have a esports specific anti-doping policy and we have an esports specific prohibited list. So we're not trying to catch guys for because they're trying to grow their pecs or get a six pack, because who cares? What we're interested in doing is stopping cheating. That's what we're that's our aim. And so our testing program is really revolves hundred percent around that. For logistical reasons, we can only really test at LAN events. We can't be driving around to team houses during online events, turning up and going, hey, would you mind peeing in this? Um, it doesn't really work that way. It would be insanely expensive. That's about $600 a test. Uh, and they're ineffective anyway. So we've been testing now, as you can see from the stats there, over 300 tests. Um, bear in mind, we're testing at really tier one, Counter-Strike, Dota, we've done some Street Fighter, some League of Legends, but we really are talking major events. This is IEM, Katowice, ESL1, high level. And so, and it's nice to see my anti-doping directors turned up at exactly the right time. Well done. <laughs> I was wondering where you were. We'll talk later. Um, so, these, these, are the, these are our latest stats. Uh, we're, we're about to head over to New York for ESL1 New York to test again. But I don't expect there to be any significant change to the trend here, which is, in effect, guys are not cheating at these events using doping. Um, now, that may be because they know they're going to get tested or there's a risk of being tested. But you can see what we've got here. Not only the no positives, but we've surveyed, I think, over 400, possibly approaching 500 players now. And none of those survey results give us particular cause for concern. We're not seeing answers that worry us. Equally, we receive all the therapeutic use exemption applications. And again, the, the, the prescription rate for the kind of drugs that we're looking for is actually lower than the national average in North America. So a lot of the players in CS come from a community where you might expect the prescription rate for ADHD type drugs to be the same as or higher than the national average. In fact, it's less than half, which says a lot about gamers. I was surprised by that, you know, bringing my prejudices to it. But that, that's, that's reassuring, that there aren't guys just being prescribed Adderall for fun, which to be honest, if you're in uh, the US is a pretty easy thing to achieve. If you want Adderall, you just go see, you know, um, I yawn too much or something and you get it. So that, that's good. Um, we do need to up the education piece. Um, we, we've run a, a number of face-to-face uh, -face programs, but we need to address that better. Um, and we have had um, below the threshold tests for recreational drugs, unfortunately. What that means is some of these young guys like to party. Bummer. Um, but they are taking massive risks because if they had taken those same drugs several hours later than they did, they would have been above the threshold on our test. They'd now be sitting out a two to five year ban, which for multi-millionaire CSGO players is not the cleverest thing they've ever done. Uh, so we talked to those guys. I talked to the CEOs of the team. We address these problems directly as they come up. Um, and uh, the truth is, we need more tournament organizers to, to do this because whether guys are doping or not, there's actually very little disincentive at the moment because 
the only chance of being tested is if you go to an e you play at a high level ESL event. Blast Pro Series is introducing testing at their finals in Copenhagen. That's great. And more people need to do that. And certainly our big leagues uh, that are not within the ESIC round, and I'm talking about Overwatch League and the three big uh, League of Legends leagues, need to step up here. I would also say the Call of Duty League, now that it's stepped up its game in terms of franchising, absolutely needs to do something about this because the social media chatter background in Call of Duty is toxic and heavy. If you believe it, and I'm not saying I do or don't, drug abuse uh, of these kind of substances within the Call of Duty community is out of control. I don't know if that's true, but that's what is being said. And the only way you can determine whether that is true and do something about it is if you start testing and implementing a policy. The question is, does Activision actually want to know? So, where are we? Match fixing. Now, this is clearly the area of most concern to me. This is where my expertise sits. This is just an update, right? So I'm trying to create a contrast here between we've been measuring figures since uh, the beginning of 2016, but I've put up last year um, 2018 figures. We had 74 meaningful alerts. I don't so what this means, let me tell you what an alert is. It's when a betting operator or a monitoring service or a regulator like, for example, the UK Gambling Commission or the Maltese Authority or the Isle of Man will tell us that one of their operators is seeing suspicious betting on a match, usually in real time, sometimes pre-match, during match or after match. It's a little bit patchy. But all that means is that the betting is behaving in a way that the market is, wasn't expecting it to behave, that the operator is seeing something unusual. We have a network, which I'll explain in a minute, that feeds that into a central point with ESIC. And we get a, quite a lot of reports. So the ones I've put up here are the ones that required a little more than five seconds thought, right? Uh, because esports is unpredictable. We get a lot of rubbish ones that you look at and go, yeah, it's nothing. These are the 74 we received last year. The, the significance really is that in 2017, as you can see, we only had 39. So we, it was a 75% increase. That's worrying um, because there's probably been that kind of growth in the betting industry alongside esports, which means that match fixing is growing at a very similar pace to the betting. Um, the worst thing about it was the one I've listed there second is that Dota 2 doubled uh, in terms of alerts. Um, CSGO remained pretty constant, as you can see, but the volume of betting on CSGO grew significantly. I, I almost tempted to think of that as a success. And certainly, anecdotally, on what I've seen this year um, so far, I know we're nine months in, it still feels like January to me, it's been really busy. Um, I, I think CSGO has stabilized and may actually be improving in t statistically. Um, I think this year we're likely to see the same number of alerts as last year, which is great, because <laughs> initially I thought if it goes double, we're going to go nuts. Um, Warcraft 3 is just weird. I mean, that whole league was just a fix. You can quote me on that. Um, Starcraft 2 is a legacy issue. Uh, it's just one of those things um, that Starcraft 2, if we're honest, was murdered by match fixing. It was the biggest esport in the world five years ago. Where is it now? Uh, and um, that's been, I think, primarily because of the death of it in South Korea through match fixing and other factors, but, but that is significant. Um, and then everything else makes up the other number of tests. So here, here's to put it in context. Dota 2, 43%, but it only accounts for about 20% of betting. There's a serious problem in the Dota 2 community, both from a match fixing and betting point of view. Um, CSGO, 27%, uh, but 43% of the betting market. So that's, as I say, I think that's relatively successful given how bad it was a couple of years ago. Um, but it does put Valve in the dock. And the simple truth is that the skins economy that grew up around 2013, 14, 15 basically groomed a generation of gamblers. And they've moved into the cash markets into the normal betting markets, which is why CS and Dota dominate uh, esports betting. That's a good and a bad thing. 
but uh, Valve currently take no responsibility for that, and I think they should, but that's a whole different story. Um, and Blizzard uh, account for an inordinate proportion of suspicious bet alerts, and as far as I can tell, are doing absolutely nothing about it. So, why is it worrying? Well, because firstly, there's no way we're seeing all the fixing, right? Uh, probably less than 10%, which means there's a hell of a lot of it going on. Um, since the, the law changed in America, we're seeing really massive and rapid growth of sports betting. Esports betting is a subset of that in some states. There's, there's regulatory issues to be resolved there, but I've no doubt that in the medium to long term, esports betting is going to be a very important component of the growth of sports betting in the US. It's inevitable because, again, it's Esports is more or less the only way to reach certain mark, certain demographics. Whether you're selling them something or wanting them to bet, that's where it's at, right? Traditional sport is, uh, in that sense, either stagnating or dying, putting the NFL and football to one side, aging audience, lowering audience. So esports uh, betting, you know, uh, I won't quote which bookmaker, but I think most of the well-established bookmakers in this space have seen at least 50% growth every year for the last number of years, and that's barely, barely slowing, and I don't expect it to slow. Um, and then the worst thing from our point of view, not one single publisher, developer, owner of a game has contributed a penny to the effort to uh, create some degree of competitive integrity and high standards within the industry, and I think that's shocking. Um, but it's the truth. So why? Now, this is partly because we're vulnerable. Esports doesn't have a governing body. There's nowhere to go with a solution. So what, and you'll hear later about um, our rebrand as an organization, but the reason we're a coalition and called a coalition is because we've had to recruit esports stakeholders, tournament organizers, one by one by one, because there's no center to the industry. And that means that there's no central standards across any aspect of of esports, nothing. No, no central standards for child protection, no live event safety standards, no integrity standards. These are all things that the industry need to address as it, as it evolves. Um, and it means our participant demographic, it, it's perfect. It's young men with disposable income. That, that's the core of the esports demographic. And that's the core of the gambling demographic. Um, and so we have that, uh, we have that issue. And the core areas of interest in eSport, the, the epicenters of it, also happen to be the epicenters of illegal gambling and unregulated gambling and unlicensed gambling. And so it's like a perfect storm, um, and it makes us vulnerable. So what, um, what do we do? Okay, so the, I think I'll, I'll get on to education because I do think that's the most important thing we do. But in terms of how do you detect match fixing, you've got to look at the betting markets. You can't watch match action and see match fixing. Because, and that's true of any sport. It, it doesn't matter. You, you can't watch a cricket match and know it's fixed. You can't watch a football match and say it's fixed, unless it's really badly fixed, <laughs> in which case sometimes you can. But sport is sport. People make mistakes. They, they screw up. What you look at is the betting. Uh, and the betting behaving in, in an unusual way. So what, one of the first things we did, and this continues to grow, is create a suspicious bet alert network where we sit at the center of a group of betting operators, both non-endemic and endemic. So guys that like Pinnacle and Skybet and Parimatch uh, who, who operate across sports betting but have an esports offering and then a lot of esports only, online only operators um, who, who have a, a, a direct and, and single focus on esports. And the regulators, so the Gambling Commission, Malta, all these guys who can tell us what's going on in the betting markets, and we aggregate that information, disseminate it to everybody, and find out what they're seeing. And we're about to automate that process as well to a web-based reporting platform so that I don't have to be awake and engaged every time something happens in eSport, because it happens a lot. Um, that is what 
identifies to me what we should be looking at. Now, obviously, if we get a suspicious, a credible suspicious betting alert that relates to a match that is being organized by an ESIC member, like ESL or DreamHack or LVP or Blast Pro, then I, I can do something about that. But of course, the vast majority are being alerted to events that are not ESIC members because, well, for, for any number of reasons. And I have to then try and find out who the tournament organizer is. Sometimes that's a hell of a lot harder than you'd think. You'd be amazed how many tournament organizer websites don't say who the organizer is or give you any contact details. It'll be a name of a company, but who's running it? How do you contact them? At best, you'll have a contact at email address, which I've never had a response to ever in four years. Um, so there, there, the, I'm just highlighting some of the issues that we're dealing with in this space. This, I think, is the most important thing we do. And this is what our betting operator partners really help us with beyond the network, is the subscription that the betting operators pay to be members of ESIC uh, every uh, annually fund our education program. So keep the online education website up, running, um, administered, but also our face-to-face -face efforts because that's expensive. Uh, traveling around, going to events, meeting with players. So many, many times a year I sit in a forum exactly like this with a series of players at a LAN event and take them through a presentation to alert them to the fact that there are rules and what those rules are, what the consequences of breaching them are. But most importantly, what does it, what does it look like to be approached by, say, a betting syndicate or, or gambler asking you to fix a match? What does that look like? What do you do about it when that happens? Because these guys don't know, and why should they know, right? And and so I, I do think this is the most important work that ESIC does. Um, we do other things. So what I've listed here are just a few of the things we do. We're at events, so there's a physical presence. And I think that makes a, a difference to the players and the organization that you're working with. Um, we work uh, within, obviously, we have an intelligence database. We alert participants to the presence of guys that shouldn't be around those events, who to talk to. Um, where we have seen known corruptors from other sports because it's what we very importantly do is liaise with all the other sport integrity units. So I talk, we, all, we use the same intelligence database as tennis, cricket, football, rugby, and we talk to each other all the time. We, we meet probably four or five times a year to discuss our approach to these things and to share intelligence. Um, and we are implementing various registration systems to try and pull these uh, various bits together. We lobby at the highest level all around the world for regulatory change because the key to safe gambling is well-regulated gambling. You're never going to get gambling to go away. Anybody who thinks that there's a way of stopping gambling on their game, their esport, their community is just deluding themselves. The gambling is happening. It's going to happen. The only question is what are you going to do about it? What's your reaction to the existence of gambling? If you sit there and say, well, we're not going to allow gambling, and I have had that response, we're not going to allow gambling on our game, say, good luck with that, right? And if you can tell me how you're going to not allow it, we're all going to make a lot of money because that's just not going to happen. It's delusion. So um, deciding on good set of rules and regulations and working alongside or in conjunction with the licensed betting industry, the guys who have to comply with really strict licensing conditions in order to make their offering to the public is the way forward. And it's what eventually will squeeze out the cowboys and the places that are uh, promoting underage gambling, bad practice, and so on uh, throughout the betting world. And that's the current state of place. So I'm really happy to take... Uh, any questions? I can't see any yet, but fire them up if there are any. But otherwise, stick your hand up and shout. I'm, yeah, big boy. <laughs> right. Let's have a look if there are any. <laughs> okay. Besides match fixing and hacks within games, what are your thoughts on match betting across uh, betting websites? Look, uh, my view on this is very clear. E6 position. Uh, on gambling itself is entirely neutral. We are not advocates for it or against it. I recognize that 
Gambling is different things to different people. The vast majority of people who bet do it for fun and within their means and gain entertainment out of that. I've got no issue with that uh, at all. Putting aside the issue of prom problem gambling, uh, you know, addiction and, and, and problem gambling, where I stand is that the esports industry needs to move closer to the betting on esports industry in order to promote integrity on both sides. And this is because the betting industry has a, has a direct interest in competitive integrity. It's in their interests for games to be played fairly uh, and to the best of the player's ability because ultimately it's their money that is stolen by the match fixers. It's the betting operator's money. So similarly, the esports organizers have a direct interest in competitive integrity because that's what it's all about. That's the product. So the, the, the middle point is the same. We're just coming at, at this from different directions and I see ESIC as sitting in the middle of that promoting it to both sides. So official data engage with the licensed betting industry and sort out your offering so that you marginalize the cowboys, the match fixers, the bad guys, and push them into the corner. That's, that's my view on that. Right, guys? Thank you very much. Uh, panel session. That's all right. That's all right.